How's it going everybody? I am Jay Nickel, AKA The Mindful Hunter, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. So due to some requests that I was getting on Instagram, I decided to do a series on how to solo film backcountry hunting. So right now, my general approach will be to do this series in three parts. Number one will be hardware, and that will be followed by software and storytelling. And I might switch the order of those two, depending when I, when I actually write the outlines, it might make more sense to do one before the other. But I think it's important that we look at our filmmaking through those three distinct lenses, pun intended. So hardware, I'm gonna cover exactly that, the actual gear that I recommend you take into the backcountry. Software, we will actually open up Adobe Premiere Pro, which is my editing platform of choice, and I'll show you how I actually cut the film, how I overlay music, uh, the way that I choose to do things that I think gives gives your film like a nice sophisticated look without being overly complicated and then three Storytelling, so what am I thinking about for shots? What do I need to capture? What is the actual arc that I want to tell? How do I want to connect with the audience and anything else that's really not covered by hardware or software? So if after watching this video on hardware, you have some specific questions you'd like me to address in future videos, leave it in the comments section below or DM me on Instagram and I'll be more than happy. People have already sent me some comments in advance of this video. So I'm compiling a bit of list of things that I want to address. Next thing I want to get out of the way, I am not an expert hunter and I am not an expert filmmaker. What I'm okay at is filming myself while hunting. I'm also gonna take credit where credit is due. I am a decent hunter, but I know people who are expert hunters. I'm not gonna put myself on their, on their level. It's just not where I'm at yet. I also know people who are excellent filmmakers. I'm not gonna put myself on their level. I think the unique perspective that I can bring is that I'm decent at both hunting and filmmaking, and I figured out a pretty realistic way for someone to go into the backcountry by themselves and capture the story of their hunt. So at first I didn't really feel like it was appropriate for me to comment on these because I don't see myself as an expert, but the more I thought about it, I, I think I do have a valid voice to offer in this field. So hopefully you guys agree and you, you get something out of this video. Okay, let's now dive right into the gear. For starters, in the last six years, I've gone through four complete iterations of gear. Every time I buy something, I use it for a while, turns out I don't like and I sell it. Here's a couple tips I'll give you right out of the gate. If you buy good shit, it will retain its value. And cameras and lenses in particular are really good at retaining the value. On average, I get 70 to 80% of what I paid for stuff one to two years later, as long as you take care of it. So don't be paralyzed by the decisions that you have to make about what to buy. You might buy the wrong stuff, it's fine. Take care of it, sell it later, buy round two. I've shot on Nikon, Canon, and Sony. Right now, Sony is my favorite. We don't have to get into this, but with the release of the A7S III, they have just cemented themselves, as far as I'm concerned, um, as the leader in um, mirrorless camera technology, which we'll get into in a little bit. The reason I tell you what I've bought is that I don't want to come off as like super brand loyal or I've only bought one thing. I've tried the gamut of DSLR and mirrorless systems and I, and, and, and through that experience, I've come to know what, what I like and also what I need and what I don't need. I will also say there are cheaper and easier ways to do this. You, really, you could do this just on a GoPro if you wanted to. I like having an artistic edge to my films and I like being able to control depth of focus and have a little bit more control over the cinemagraphic elements of my film. So I choose to shoot on a mirrorless. So let's, let's, let's get into that. What do I mean by mirrorless? So initially, everybody shot on DSLR. Sony then developed really high quality mirrorless technology. From a functional standpoint, they're the same. They shoot the same, the menus are similar, you treat them the same way, you adjust shutter speed, aperture, and ISO in similar manners. The fundamental difference and why mirrorless is so important for the backcountry is weight savings. Mirrorless are far lighter than DSLR. So my main camera is a Sony A7 III. You don't need that much horsepower. The A6000 series have some really nice options. Here's what I like about the a7 III. It's full frame. So when you buy a 24 millimeter lens, you're shooting 24 millimeter. 
When you buy a three quarter crop, I think a 24 millimeter film ends up, or 24 millimeter lens ends up being a 35 millimeter frame because the, the sensor is only three quarters the size, which is not the end of the world. If you're looking to save money, buy a three quarter crop sensor family. I recommend something in the A6000 series um, and just buy slightly larger lenses than you want. You know, if you want an 18 mil lens, buy a 10 mil lens. It'll turn into an 18 mil lens on a three quarter crop camera. So main camera, A7 III. If you've got the money, I would buy it. The only caveat to that, the A7S III drops end of September. It's gonna be about a thousand bucks more than the A7 III, but it blows it out of the water. So if you've got the cash, A7S III, hands down. Option number two, A7 III. Budget option, something in the A6000 series. That's main camera, done. Lenses. Here's another one where I have probably bought 15 to 25 lenses over the, over the past six years. I've sold them all. I now have one lens. This I think is something I very strongly recommend for backcountry filming. You do not need multiple lenses and decent lenses are super heavy. I also think you should go with a prime lens. One, it forces you to be more creative with your shots. Two, it's way lighter. And three, for the cost, you're gonna get far superior glass in a prime lens to a zoom lens. So for example, if you had two grand, if you could buy just a 24 mil, or you bought an equivalent 24 to 70 mil for the same two grand, the glass in the prime lens is gonna be far superior to the zoom lens. It's not far superior, I shouldn't say that. It's gonna be noticeably better than the zoom lens. You would have to spend close to four grand on a zoom lens to get the same quality glass as you would on a $2,000 prime lens. Also, um, it's gonna be constant aperture. So basically, if the lens says it's an F1.4, most zoom lenses, that aperture is going to decrease, technically increase, as you zoom in. So if you're at, if it's an F1.4 at 24 mil, when you get up to 70 mil, you're only gonna have like 3.5 or 4.5. And this is gonna reduce the light gathering capabilities of that lens, which is another fundamentally important characteristic for backcountry filming because we do a lot of stuff at dusk and we do a lot of stuff at dawn. So you need a large aperture. You want that aperture number, that f-stop number to be as low as possible on the number you, on the lens that you buy. My prime recommendation, 24 mil f1.4 G series lens from Sony. It's expensive, but it's beautiful. It's wide enough that you can do like the handheld walking around vlogging shots, but it's not so wide that you're gonna get distortion in the field and you're still gonna be able to get some nice landscape shots and tell the story from a geographic uh, perspective of like where you are and what's going on and where you're walking and pointing at things. So that's my recommendation, 24 millimeter lens and get as big of an aperture as you can afford. The other way that people describe that is it's a fast lens. Faster lenses have lower aperture numbers. So you want as fast a lens as possible. Only buy one, get a prime lens, my recommendation. Camera two, GoPro. Don't give a shit which one you buy. Right now, to be honest with you, because the eights just came out, the sevens are like 100, 150 bucks cheaper. And except for a couple of small options, there's really no significant difference. So if you're looking to save a couple bucks, get uh, the GoPro seven. If you've got extra cash, get the GoPro eight. I've never used any other action cameras. I I've heard good reviews of other ones. I, I don't give a shit. Whichever one you wanna buy is fine. But my recommendation is have two cameras. You're gonna have one main camera, which is gonna be your DSLR or mirrorless, and you're gonna have a second backup camera, which is going to be your, your GoPro. The, for, for a number of reasons that we'll get into in telling the story, but even just for weather-related reasons, for leaving behind related reasons, for capturing two different angles of the same thing, there's a lot of options, and it's a very cheap way to add a lot of diversity to your filmmaking. In essence, you are also gonna need a third camera. You're gonna need your smartphone. And this is the other reason that I recommended one prime lens, because if you have your smartphone and phone scope adapters for your binoculars and your spotting scope, essentially you have a whole series of super high quality zoom lenses at your disposal for those farther shots. 
I've got a mount for my binos and I can get like a 10 by zoom. And I've got a mount for my spotting spotting scope so I can get like a 23 up to 70 by zoom. Um, so I also recommend um, having a smartphone with those adapters to kind of yet again, increase the variety of shots you'll be able to take. So let's take a minute and talk attachment devices. I highly recommend the Peak Designs Capture Clip Pro. This is a small device that attaches to a backpack strap and then a tripod adapter plate goes on the bottom of your camera and you're able to click your camera in and out of your backpack strap. This is probably the single most important piece of backcountry hunting gear I can recommend because you are only as good as the access you have to your camera. If something cool happens and your camera's buried in your backpack, it doesn't matter because no one's ever gonna see it except for you. So having that ability to quickly access your camera, yet keep it in a safe and sturdy environment is very important. I've even gotten to the point where you can, you can put your camera in a large gallon uh, Ziploc freezer bag upside down and the clip will still work through the Ziploc bag so you can actually have some light rain protection while still keeping your camera on your chest ready for action. I can even shoot my bow with the camera in that case. I've done several experiments with it like that. The second thing I use is an outdoorsman's tripod and I like their pan head adapter. So I also have uh, outdoorsman's adapter plates for all of my gear that I use on tripods, my binoculars, my spotting scope and my camera. And this way, I only ever have to switch adapter plates once. I haven't been able to solve that particular problem and find one adapter plate that would allow me to go onto the tripod and onto the capture clip. Peak Designs does make a tripod that would solve that issue for my, for my main camera body, but then I would also have to get Peak Designs um, adapter plates for all of my other equipment and they don't even make those, so it's not an option. So that's just one kind of workaround that you don't that I haven't figured out a better way to fix. So you are introducing one element if you wanna switch. I rarely put my camera on my tripod anymore. I used to do it all the time. I just don't find the need anymore. Uh, trophy shots at the end, uh, pictures, is really the only time I put it on the tripod and some like landscape panning shots, I'll do it. But with the in-camera stabilization and the in-lens stabilization being so good, you can literally hold your camera close to your body and just spin your body and you'll get actually a nice pan shot when you want it. But we'll cover that more in one of the later chapters. For the GoPro, there's three attachments that I'm gonna recommend. Number one, a small Gorilla Pod. Don't cheap out and buy the shitty one on Amazon. Buy the actual Joby Gorilla Pod. The reason I like these is that you can use it as a tripod to set it up and film whatever you want, but you can also wrap these legs around a tree branch and you could do a time lapse of gutting an animal. You could capture a calling sequence with elk. You could actually capture the kill shot if you were good, knew the relative area you were gonna end up in. Um, also, when you leave the GoPro on this, you can actually just stuff this into your bino strap on your chest harness. And then you kind of walk around, you have quick access to a GoPro and quick access to a DSLR. So it's very functional. And that's one of the other primary concepts that you need to get through your head when you're thinking about solo backcountry filming. How can I keep things ready and quick to grab, but stable enough that I can hike around and shit's not clanging and falling off me all the time? So a lot of the little tips and tricks that I've learned over the years is just how to securely attach things that I can quickly get access to. So keep that in mind moving forward. The second attachment for the GoPro I'm gonna recommend is a headband. This you can buy cheap as dirt on Amazon, 10, 15 bucks. Doesn't matter, it's an elastic headband with a little GoPro attachment up front. This is great for uh, the last you know, 100 to 200 meters of a stock. Uh, this is great for just walking around footage when you're trying to tell the story of transitioning from one area to another area. There's all kinds of instances when this head mounted GoPro is fantastic. The final attachment I'll recommend is a windshield adapter for your vehicle. I think I'll get into this more in the story chapter, but one of the things that took me a long time to learn is you need footage to tie 
scenes and to tie elements of your film together. You can't just all of a sudden be on the mountain and then all of a sudden be in your tent and then all of a sudden be at home. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense for the viewer and they tend to get lost. You need this, I call it transition footage. I'm not a film student, there's probably a better name for it, but I'm always thinking in my head, okay, if I'm going from point A to point B, or if I'm doing something over here and then all of a sudden I'm doing something over here, how am I gonna tell the story of transitioning between these two discrete points in my film? Having a quick adapter and just, I just leave it on there year round. And then that way, if I get in the truck and I'm driving a new spot, I just flip the GoPro on, hit record, get five minutes of highway footage, five minutes of logging road footage, five minutes of whatever footage. And then when I got home, I know I got this extra B roll that I can use to, to splice in between. Plus I do these really like kick-ass drives. Like I do oh, Vancouver to fucking New Mexico, or um, I'll go to from Vancouver all the way up to Fort Nelson. And it's really cool to get some of the mountain footage, um, get some slow-mo stuff, get some time-lapse stuff. We'll cover that more in the, in the story element. But those are the three. So, so let's back up. Attachments for your, your, your main camera are gonna be the Peak Designs capture clip for your backpack and a tripod adapter to go on whatever tripod system of your choice. For GoPro, you are going to want a headband attachment, a Joby Gorillapod, and a windscreen attachment for your truck. Next up, batteries and charging. Here is the other really beneficial advantage to the Sony uh, A-Series cameras. The, the initial line of these cameras were terrible with batteries, but the newer ones are phenomenal. I've gone up to five days before on one battery with some like decent filming um, every day. So I recommend you get two batteries for your whatever DSLR mirrorless you choose to buy. GoPros are shit. Our tops, if you're filming straight and that battery will be dead. I recommend a minimum of three GoPro batteries. In addition to that, I recommend packing one minimum 20,000 milliamp hour battery pack. I use the Anchor ones off Amazon. They're 45 bucks and they work amazing. I know everybody's like, you know, this brand, that, this brand, that. I'm gonna be honest with you. I've used them for years. I've never had problems with them. I've been in the heat, I've been in the cold. They work really good and they're affordable. That's my recommendation. So the other benefit of having this Anchor battery is that you'll be able to charge your phone. Now, most of my trips, I go back to the truck every four to five days, depending on the setup. One of these 20,000 milliamp battery packs is perfect for that. I can do the GoPro batteries two or three times. I can do at least one full iPhone charge and I still have you know 25% of the battery pack left for emergencies. Now, I am planning my first sheep hunt and planning to go in for 10 to 14 days straight. At that point, I will either need to severely limit my GoPro usage and smartphone usage, or I will need to look at bringing in another battery pack to address the fact that I need an additional five to six days of battery power. So quick recap, two batteries for your main camera, three batteries for your GoPro, and one 20,000 milliamp hour backup battery pack to power the whole thing. Next up, media storage. I recommend getting a waterproof SD card holder off of Amazon. They're not expensive. They're like 10, 15 bucks a piece. I think you should probably have at least three to four high-end SD cards for both your camera and your GoPros. Your GoPros will go through them faster than your camera will. I like getting 128 gig ones. For your DSLR, I recommend getting 2000 X cards or 300 megabits per second. And for your GoPro, I recommend getting, and you need to get the micro SD cards for GoPros, obviously. And I recommend getting at least 633 speed. When it comes to the mirrorless camera, if you get a card that's not fast enough, it will limit the functionality of your camera. For example, if you have the a7 III and you're hoping to do 120 frames per second in 1080p, you need a 2000X card or a card that is capable of writing at 300 megabits per second, or your camera simply won't let you record. And you'll either have to go to, to 1080p at 60 frames per second, or drop it down to 720p at 120 frames per second. So don't skimp out on SD cards. These are two things I find that rookies skimp out on are SD cards and lenses. And the reality of the situation is these are some of the most critical 
uh, bottlenecks in your production chain that are gonna limit the quality and the reliability of your setup. So I highly recommend if you're gonna dump money, dump it on lenses and SD cards. You can always replace a, a, a camera body later. This is an interesting topic that I don't think a lot of people understand. For example, you could right now buy a cheap A6000 body, buy a really expensive E-mount lens, and then next year you could sell your camera body on Craigslist you could buy an AS3 body and your the lens that you bought for the A6000 is still gonna fit the new camera. This is one of my problems with Canon, their whole new R series is they're forcing everyone to buy new glass, which I think is extremely short-sighted. Um, and yet another reason why personally I think Canon is kind of on the way out, but that's a rant that I won't get into for now. Let's have a quick chat about audio. I recommend a product from Rode. I think it's called the Rode Video Mic Grow or Mic Go. Uh, it's the cheapest one. It's 75 bucks. It comes with a dead cat, which is that little fluffy cover. And it comes with a little shock mount so that it doesn't, um, you don't hear the vibrations of the camera through the mic. I've tried a bunch of different on-camera mics and I, for the money, you can't beat this one. If you got unlimited funds, go buy a $300 Rode mic or Sennheiser, it'll sound fantastic. But this is one of those things, I don't think more money in a linear fashion leads to higher quality when it comes to audio, but I do highly recommend having a dead cat on your microphone because otherwise half your footage is gonna be shot with wind noise. And I've had really good luck adjusting wind noise in post using this the Rode Video Micro um, microphone. So highly recommend that as an additional piece of gear. The one last accessory I guess I would mention is this year I bought a mountain bike handle GoPro mount and I mounted that directly to my trekking pole to give me another point of view perspective. So now I can walk around with it in my hand on the tripod. I could put it on the trekking pole and hold it out to get a bit more perspective. And I can put it on my head to get those like walking shots. This is something we'll get into more in the story chapter of this series, but it's like, ask yourself, how can I create the illusion of a variety of camera angles when I'm just by myself? And I hate the walk ahead, drop the camera, walk back, walk towards it. I get why people do it, but listen, man, you're by yourself. The whole point of filmmaking is like the suspension of disbelief. You want people to forget that they're watching a film and you want them to be immersed in it. The minute I see that, I love Remy Warren to death. I think he's one of the greatest hunters of our generation and one of the greatest solo filmmakers of our generation. And I understand why he does it, but I hate it. Because every time I see him walking towards the camera from a half a mile away, the first thing, that runs through my head is he dropped his pack, he walked the camera all the way up there, he set it up, he walked all the way back, and then walked towards the camera just to get the shot. And that ruins it for me. So I like to find more creative ways to do it. The exception with that is if you're trying to get your gear in, in a spot and stock situation to capture the kill shot or that last sequence, and you're having to ferry equipment in, like you're belly crawling with your bow, going back, getting your camera, belly crawling with your camera. That's a totally different situation. I just hate this false narrative of, oh, there's just this random camera sitting here. Or when you see people walking off up the trail away from their truck, it's like, well, how the fuck did you get your camera? Anyways, rant aside, this is a really good segue for me to kind of conclude this video. Your ultimate responsibility is to have a successful hunt. For me, secondarily, the responsibility is to tell the story. So I don't do things to tell the story that would limit the likelihood of success on my hunt. I've missed kill shots. I've not taken my camera out at times because I didn't want to make noise. I haven't got phone scope footage before because there was a chance to make a stock on an animal. And if I waited another 30 to 45 seconds to get some phone scope, phone scope footage, I may not have been able to get in for a successful stock. And I'm okay with that because a successful story will survive without a couple of key moments. A successful hunt won't. Your hunt can live or die on one or two individual moments. The story is not like that. So in conclusion, keep it simple, keep it light, keep it reliable. If you pass your decisions through those three filters when you're, S when you're deciding which gear it is you wanna buy, you will be just fine. So 
Up next will be software and storytelling. If you have any questions about those two chapters, drop a comment below or hit me up on Instagram. Also, if you have any specific gear questions or if you're contemplating this camera versus that camera, this lens versus that lens, and you want a little feedback, please hit me up. It took me a long time and a lot of wasted money to figure out what worked for me. So if there's any way I can help you guys be more successful right out of the gate, I'm more than happy to do that. I deeply appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. And if you found it useful, you know, a like down below and, and a comment would, I really appreciate it. So thank you very much for watching and I hope everybody has a great season this year.